eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
Before time began, you were on your throne, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you were on your throne, you are God alone. Sometimes our world is broken. Sometimes we feel like we are in the shadows and they just go darker and darker. But we should remember that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through. Who is the light? Jesus. He is the light and he makes our life light. And I, I just want to start with reading Psalm 23. That's what David said and that's what we can say. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please, let's sing together. Thank you. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in you. I believe if you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints' communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. such an amazing message. Amen. Praise to the Lord. I love it. And the next one we go into is called King of Kings. And I just love that song because it starts with, in the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light. Because every person walking in this world was born into darkness without hope and without light but then God saw us and he loved us and he became man lived a perfect life to take our sins our transgressions on himself and died on the cross the death that we deserve what an amazing God we have. Isn't that amazing, you guys? Amen. It is amazing. John 15. Where did my verse go there? 13 says. So John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus loves us so much that he took our sins and died on the cross for us. He rose again after three days so that when we believe in him, we have already crossed over from death to life. We're born again. The sins are washed away. Let's just sing the song. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a word you gave the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dark
transition now for a few moments into a time of communion. And uh, for those of you who have been around the Grace Place, you know that if it's Acts 242 Sunday, it's also Communion Sunday. And so uh, I get the privilege this morning of leading us in this time of communion. Today, a little bit later today, we will have another time of communion. We will commune with each other. We will fellowship with each other. And as I was kind of preparing for this short little Part of the service, uh, it struck me that communion obviously is a term that we use oftentimes exchanging it for the Lord's Supper. So some of you know this probably better as the Lord's Supper. Others of you know it as communion. But it's really a time of communion, and it's a time of fellowship. And uh, if you look at Acts 2.42, which is what we call our, our potluck, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship or communion, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And this morning, we will do all of those things, including the breaking of bread, obviously in this time of communion, but also at the back uh, after the service is over. And by the way, as Harold mentioned, even if you didn't bring something, make sure you stay for the potluck. It's a wonderful time to get to know some of the people. There'll be plenty of food. Uh, God was able to uh, take those loaves and fishes and feed 5,000. I think we can handle this group. So uh, please stay even if you didn't bring something today. But we're going to fellowship today as fellow believers. And we know that when we do, Jesus is in our midst. He's in our midst always, and we know that. But I think there are special times when we're gathered together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we just feel that sense of Christ being among us. And today, as I was preparing, I was thinking about a verse out of 1 John, and it's 1 John 1, 3. And the disciples writes, 
We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. He was an eyewitness, so that we may also have fel- that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son Jesus the Christ. Well, how does that relate to communion? What does that? How does that connect? Well, I think the apostle was talking about that relationship that he had as he walked this earth with Jesus during that earthly ministry. He knew Jesus. He was a friend of Jesus. In fact, he called himself the the apostle or the disciple that Jesus loved. He kind of put himself at the top of the list, but I know that's not true because I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, and I'm pretty sure in your own mind you're thinking you're the disciple Jesus loved. So at least I hope you think that because he does. He loves you deeply. They had a personal relationship. John had a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's what he's telling us that we have too. We may not have been able to walk with Jesus as he walked this earth, but we have that same personal relationship, that same intimacy that those disciples had with Jesus. As we share in this time of communion, it's a time to reflect on that personal relationship. Jesus opened that door for us through what he did on that cross that's represented on either side here. He opened that door, and all we have to do is step through that door. All we have to do is say, yes, I accept that gift that you're offering to me, and he is faithful. And so now we're going to come together in a few moments, and we're going to remember that gift of the cross and what Jesus did through his atoning death. For those of you who are new and this morning, we had a lot of new people. It was wonderful to see so many people walking around with coffee cups. And if you didn't get one, make sure you get one. Uh, but we love seeing that. But, but you may not be aware, we do open communion here, which means communion is not restricted to those who regularly attend the Grace Place. Anybody who is a child of God, anybody who is a follower of Jesus is welcome to take communion here. So even if this is your first Sunday, feel free. For those of you who may not have made that decision for Jesus, you may not have accepted him as your personal Savior, we would just ask that you reflect on that relationship that you could have with Jesus and let the the elements as they're passed go by and spend that time reflecting. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love you. It just means you haven't developed that relationship that's really required for those of us who take communion. And for those of us who do, we should reflect on our own lives. Are we taking that communion in a worthy manner? And in Corinthians, Paul tells them to be careful about how they take communion. And I'll read a little bit of that later, but we're supposed to be careful. We're supposed to make sure that we don't hold something against a brother or sister. And so if you're in a situation where you know in your heart that you probably shouldn't take communion, don't feel obligated to just because the elements come by. Make sure that you're ready for it. And again, remember, none of us is perfect. None of us is truly worthy to take communion, but through Jesus, we are made worthy. Our worship team is going to sing a song while they pass, the gentlemen come up and pass the elements out to you called In Awe of You. And just the title of that, I think, is something we should reflect on while we're preparing for communion. Just think about the awe that we should have of that one who hung on that cross when it should have been us of that awe that the God of all creation cared enough about us to send Jesus to this earth to live a sinless life, one that we couldn't do, so that we could be redeemed back to God, that we could be reconciled to God. Spend time reflecting on that as we sing this song. Hold your elements when you get them, and we'll all partake together while we sing this song. Gentlemen, go on forward and and pass out the, uh, the cups to everybody. Thank you. Okay. 
1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, For I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in pieces and then said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Join me in prayer before we take the elements. Jesus, just as Paul did, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the gift that you've given us. And we remember that today through these elements. We remember it through the bread. We remember it through the fruit of the vine representing your body and your blood. And we thank you for that. Let's take the bread. And I usually share with you, I kind of, in reminder of Jesus' body being broken for us, I break the bread before I take it. We take and eat. And then Paul continues, in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again in remembrance. Let's take the cup, reminding us of Jesus' shed blood. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. 
thank you for this gift of communion that we get to do. It's a command, and yet it's such a gift to remember that finished work of the cross that Jesus did. And so we thank you, Father. We especially thank you for that gift of the cross and for that resurrection just three days later and that you reconciled us to you through that gift of sacrifice through Jesus our Lord. We thank you, and we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll get into our message now. There are notes over there if you would like to follow along and uh, fill in some blanks. Uh, they're over on the table over there, and there's also Bibles over there as well as tracts and all kinds of fun stuff. But the Bibles are there for anyone who doesn't have one if you'd like to follow along. And if you don't own a Bible, we say take that Bible home and make it yours. We want everybody to uh, have a Bible uh, in their home. So uh, let's, uh, let's open now our time of teaching with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you, to worship you in prayer, to worship you in music, to worship you in communion. After this, we'll worship you in fellowship. We worship you in giving. And at this moment, Lord, we now worship you in the opening and teaching of your word. And Lord, we do pray that you would receive it as our worship, as we submit ourselves to you and your word. Lord, may you receive that as worship. We pray now that you would bless Harold as he brings forth the message from your word, and that you would anoint the words of his mouth and anoint our ears and our hearts to be able to receive that which you have for us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good to see all of you this morning. And uh, we are in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19 this morning. We only do seven verses. So first seven verses in, in chapter 19. So hopefully all of you brought your Bibles because we'll look at a lot of different Bible verses this morning, so you will be busy just, you know, looking up those Bible verses. So, um, Paul, he talked about chapter 18 last Sunday, and his topic was the proclamation, presence, protection, and plan of God, and he emphasized on two verses in, in chapter 18. It was uh, verses 9 and 10, and I want to read them again because they are really uh, powerful said, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. I think this is pretty powerful what Jesus spoke to Paul in these two verses, isn't it? That don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. And then she said, I'm with you. I'm with you. No one will attack and harm you. And many people in this city belong to me. This must have been such an incredible encouragement for the Apostle Paul. Just imagine the Lord Jesus speaking to you those words. The Apostle Paul was on his second missionary journey. And he did what he always did. In verse 5 in chapter 18, we, we read that Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. A couple of weeks ago, we said that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul did here. And really throughout his whole life as a believer in Jesus. Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's so cool throughout the book of Acts. I mean, we see it everywhere, all the time. 
Paul shared the good news about Jesus wherever he went. And later in, in Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul came back from his second missionary journey. In verse 22, we read that he went back to Antioch. And then in verse 23, we learn that Paul spent some time in Antioch. We don't know exactly how long. And then he started out on his third missionary journey. And this is where we'll be this morning. He went back through Galatia and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. So he visited the churches in Derby, in Lystra, in Iconium, in Antioch of Pisidia. These were churches that he, he had started during his first missionary journey. And in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, the apostle Paul reached Ephesus. In chapter 19, in the book of Acts, tells us quite a bit of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So Ephesus was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. The population of Ephesus was around 300,000. So Ephesus had a large harbor, and it was a very important commercial center. It attracted many visitors because one of the seven wonders of the world, of the ancient world, was in Ephesus. It was the Temple of Artemis, or the Temple of Diana. So the Temple of Artemis, or the, also known as the Temple of Diana, was the largest building in the world at that time. I read it was 418 feet by 239 feet. So it was longer than a football field. There were 100 columns that were over 50 feet high. And in the sacred enclosure of the temple stood the sacred image of Artemis. And Artemis was a fertility goddess. And because of that, cultic prostitution was part of her worship. So Ephesus clearly was a stronghold of Satan. It was a stronghold of Satan. But God, in his power, he opened the door to the good news about Jesus. As we know, Satan is powerful, but God is all-powerful. And God opened that door for the gospel, for the good news about Jesus. In Acts 19, verse 20, we actually read that the message about the Lord Jesus spread widely and had a powerful effect. God is all-powerful. So today, in the next two Sundays, we'll be in, in Acts chapter 19. And as I said before, this morning we'll study verses 1 through 7. And we'll look at two very important doctrines. Sometimes they cause a lot of confusion. But I believe it doesn't have to be that way. So our topic this morning is two very important doctrines that often cause confusion. But now let's read verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come Later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So that's an unusually short passage for us in the book of Acts. Usually we have a longer passage, but I mean... There's, there's a lot there. As I said before, our topic today is two very important doctrines that often cause confusion. Before we talk about these two doctrines, I would like to share a few things. First of all, look at verse 1 again. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. In verse 7, we read that there were 12 of them. In other translations, instead of the word believers, the word disciples is used. 
For example, the, the NIV says, there he found some disciples. The word disciple means learner or follower. And I believe that these 12 men were most likely followers or disciples of Apollos, who taught in Ephesus, as we learned last week in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26. In, in, in Acts 18, verse 25, we read that Apollos had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. And then we read, however, he knew only about John's baptism. According to Acts 18.26, Aquila and Priscilla invited him to their home and explained the way of God even more accurately. So this is what they did with Apollos. And the 12 men in our passage this morning also knew only about John's baptism. So they didn't fully understand what Jesus had done. Romans 8 verse 9 says this about true believers in Jesus. Romans 8 verse 9 says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And then the Paul, the Paul says, And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So after Paul asked these two men in verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They replied, no. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So the fact that these 12 men haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in them shows that they had never truly been born again. The Apostle Paul sensed that there was something missing in, in their lives because they didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And I'm pretty sure that the Apostle Paul explained the good news about Jesus to these men. He shared with them that Jesus died for their sins and, and that Jesus rose from the dead and, and that they have to believe in Jesus as their Savior from sin. And this is when they truly understood the good news about Jesus and when they trusted in Jesus as their Savior from sin. And this is when they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And then the Apostle Paul baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus in, in verse 5. But now let's talk about the two very important doctrines that often cause uh, confusion. First of all, the doctrine, the first doctrine I want to talk about is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned several times here in verses 2 and 6. As I just read before, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them, no. They replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then in verse 6, then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. It is so important for us to have a right biblical understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We will answer two questions this morning about the Holy Spirit, and they should help us a little bit in our understanding regarding the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The first question is, who is the Holy Spirit? And as I said at the beginning, we will look at a lot of other passages in Scripture, not here in the book of Acts, but somewhere else. So first of all, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit also is a person. He's not a force or an influence. No, not at all. The Holy Spirit is referred to as a person in treatment. For example, we may quench the Holy Spirit. We may resist the Holy Spirit. We may grieve the Holy Spirit. We may lie to the Holy Spirit. Another point is that personal acts are attributed to the Holy Spirit. For example, the Holy Spirit teaches. He reproves or convicts. He leads. He He speaks, he intercedes, he regenerates. The Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit is God because he possesses divine attributes. The Holy Spirit is eternal. Hebrews 9 verse 14. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent according to Psalm 
139. The Holy Spirit is God because he performs divine works. The Holy Spirit makes us a new creation. John 3, 5 through 7. The Holy Spirit is the creator. The Holy Spirit gave us the word of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. The Holy Spirit is linked with the other members of the Godhead in Matthew 28, 19. The Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. This is the sin of unbelief. So the Holy Spirit is God because he is called God in the Bible. And I want to read two passages. They uh, point out that the Holy Spirit is called God. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. So 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. There it says, For the Lord is the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. And now turn to Acts chapter 5 for a minute, and I will read verses 3 and 4. And we talked about this passage a few months ago. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. It's about Ananias and Sapphira. And then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? And then he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? And then he said, you were not lying to us, but to God. So he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You were not lying to us, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. That's the answer to our first question. Who is the Holy Spirit? The second question we want to answer is, what are the ministries of the Holy Spirit? So what does the Holy Spirit do? And you can find a seven of them in your notes. The first one is restraining. So turn with me, and I want to read at least one verse to every single one of them. So turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. There we read, and now you know that, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. At work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And here is verse 7 in the NLT. It says, for this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. So this ministry of the Holy Spirit has all mankind in view. Restraining means holding back. So what restrains us from sin? I mean, here are a few examples. Other believers hold us back from sinning or restrain us or laws hold us back from sinning, or our conscience holds us back from sinning. And of course, the Holy Spirit holds us back from sinning. So the Holy Spirit restrains. That's, that's the first ministry of the Holy Spirit. The second one is convicting. Let's read John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. John 16, 7 through 11. So turn with me to John chapter 16. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Jesus speaking here, because if I don't, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness 
and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So this ministry of the Holy Spirit is directed to unbelievers. And even though God uses us as his children to help unbelievers to see their sin, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict them of, your sin, of their sin. So it's always very dangerous when we try to do the Holy Spirit's job. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts them of their sin. So if we live our lives in, in a God-honoring way, God can and will use that in a powerful way to convict unbelievers of their sin and of God's righteousness. And God uses us as his children to convict unbelievers of the fact that Satan is condemned and defeated and of the coming judgment. So the Holy Spirit convicts. The third ministry of the Holy Spirit is regenerating. Regenerating. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. And I know we go through a lot of Bible verses this morning, but I think it is so important for us to understand the different ministries of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Yeah, we read, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So regeneration means the new birth people experience when they trust in Jesus for their salvation. Regeneration is the giving of eternal life. And as we know, the free gift of eternal life is received by faith in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. So when does this happen? It happens at the moment of salvation. It happens at the moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit regenerates. The Holy Spirit gives eternal life. This is what we mean when we talk about regeneration. That was the third one. The fourth one is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want to read two passages here. The first one is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Galatians 3, verse 2 says, Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. And then Apostle Paul said, you received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. And then I want to read again Romans 8 verse 9 and also verse 11. Romans 8 verse 9 says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you, indwelling you. And remember that those who, don't, who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And then in verse 11, it says, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. So every believer in Jesus is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in everyone who believes in Jesus. Another way of saying it is that the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer in Jesus. He takes up residence in us. And when does the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happen? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens at the moment of salvation. So the Holy Spirit indwells believers in Jesus. 
That brings you to the next one. The next one is baptizing. There's a baptizing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. It says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the, so it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit. And we all share the same spirit. And in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, we read, Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, this is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit unites a believer with Jesus and with all other believers. So we become part of God's family where Jesus is the head. So the believer in Jesus is placed into the body of Christ and is joined to Jesus in such a way that he is in Christ. When does the baptism of the Holy Spirit happen? The baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at the moment of salvation. It happens automatically and immediately at the moment a person trusts in Christ. So it also happens at the moment of salvation. So we have two more to go. The next one is sealing. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of God, at the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were, and here's the phrase, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And here's one more in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit is the seal. Sealing means to keep us safe and secure in our salvation. Every believer in Jesus is sealed with the Holy Spirit. When does the sealing of the Holy Spirit happen? It happens at the moment of salvation. So there's one more. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let's read Ephesians 5, verse 18. And why I wanted to mention all of them is because it is so, so important for us to have a right understanding what all those different ministries really mean. So Ephesians 5, 18 says, Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned before, the regenerating, the indwelling, the baptizing, and the sealing ministries of the Holy Spirit all happen at the time of salvation. All of them are once-for-all ministries. The filling of the Holy Spirit, however, is the possession of only those believers in Jesus who meet certain conditions. We don't have time to go in all the details, but here are three conditions that the Bible points out that need to be met in order for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first one is, do not quench the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. And we quench the Holy Spirit when we say no to the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit when we resist the Holy Spirit. This is actually rebellion 
against God. When we say no to the Holy Spirit, we resist His will. So do not quench the Holy Spirit. The second one is do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's in Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians 4, 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we grieve the Holy Spirit when we have unconfessed sin in our lives. When sin is in our lives, we don't lose the Holy Spirit, but we lose His control. Unconfessed sin affects our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. So what's the solution? Confess your sin. That's the solution. Confess your sin. Many years ago, I heard someone say that confession is the Christian's bar of soap. Confession is the Christian's bar of soap. So when you have unconfessed sin in your life, confess it. Make it right. So that your relationship, that your fellowship with God will be restored again and your fellowship with others. And the third one is in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Holy Spirit. So do not quench the Holy Spirit, and do not um, grieve the Holy Spirit, and walk in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians, uh, Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A walk in the Spirit means a moment-by-moment, -moment, a step-by-step -step relationship. Only if we learn to depend on the Holy Spirit in whatever we do, we'll be able to live a life in victory. So the filling of the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit takes full control of the believer in Jesus. But it is possible for believers in Jesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit one day and not be filled with the Holy Spirit the next day. In Ephesians 5.18, we read that we should be filled with with the Holy Spirit. I think the best way of saying it is keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit has different ministries. And the Holy Spirit works in powerful ways. And it is so important for us to have a sound biblical understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to briefly say something about the second part of verse 6. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. It says, they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Do you know how many times in the book of Acts we read about tongues? As far as I know, it's only three times. The first time... It is in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And as we know in Acts chapter 2, the good news about Jesus was shared with the Jewish people. The second time we read about tongues is in Acts chapter 10, when the good news about Jesus goes to the Gentiles. And the third time we read about tongues is here in Acts chapter 19, when the good news about Jesus is shared with these 12 men. So every time we see tongues in the book of Acts, it is in connection with sharing the good news about Jesus with the new people group. In all three situations, tongues were clearly a known language so that others could hear the good news about Jesus in their own language. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22 we read that speaking in tongues is a sign, and then the Apostle Paul says, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Of course, so that they can hear the gospel and trust in Christ. So speaking in tongues is not evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit or of being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And as we read before in Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul tells all of us, he kind of commands all of us who are believers in Jesus, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say anything about speaking in tongues, nothing. So we need to learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit in everything we do so that the Holy Spirit takes full control of our lives. So this was the first very important doctrine. It was the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So let's move on to the second one. That's baptism in verses 3 through 5. I'm going to read 3 through 5 again. Then what, uh, then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So just that it is so very important for us to have a right understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, it is equally important to understand what the Bible teaches about baptism. And the Bible mentions several different baptisms. And we talked a little bit about them as we studied Acts chapter 10, 34 through 48. But I want to talk about them again this morning because it is really important that we have a biblical understanding of um, what the Word of God says about baptism. So the first one is the baptism of Moses. The baptism of Moses. And I can only go through them very briefly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, this is where we read about the baptism of Moses. So when the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt... They were baptized as followers of Moses, meaning that they were identified with Moses. They were identified with Moses. The second baptism we read about is the baptism of John in Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. So John the Baptist preached that people should be baptized to show that they have, had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. So John the Baptist preached in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance of sin, and it was looking forward to the coming Messiah. The third baptism is the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. As we know, Jesus did not need to repent of his sin. He was sinless. He never sinned. Jesus' baptism was an act of identifying with sinful humanity. The baptism of Jesus. The fourth one is the baptism of fire. In Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12, John prophesied that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the baptism with fire refers to Jesus' judging of the world for its sin. So that's the baptism of fire. The next one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we talked about it before. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And as I said before, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at the moment of salvation and identifies a believer with Jesus. The baptism with the Holy Spirit unites a believer with Jesus. It joins a believer to Jesus. The sixth one is the baptism of the cross. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. And in Mark 10, 39, Jesus said this, He said, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. So Jesus used the language of baptism as he was talking about his sufferings he was to endure. 
And then the seventh one is the water baptism of believers. Matthew 28, verse 19. The baptism with the Holy Spirit saves us, and water baptism is the outward expression of what has already happened in our hearts. And it was so amazing that we had, I think, all the year, like 20 people this year who got baptized. That was, that was so cool. Baptisms are one of my favorite things to do. But as, as I said, water baptism doesn't save anybody. The baptism with the Holy Spirit, this is what saves you. Water baptism is just an outward expression of what already happened in your heart. So only two of, those, of, of the seven baptisms in Scripture are of personal significance for us today. The first one is, of course, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. At the moment a person trusts in Jesus as Savior, the baptism with the Holy Spirit saves us and unites us with Jesus. And the second one is water baptism of believers in Jesus. Water baptism, as I said, is an outward expression of what already happened in your heart. It's a proclamation to the seen and unseen world that a person belongs to Jesus. And you're saying, I want to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. Also, water baptism is a step of obedience. And because Jesus said that the one who loves him obeys his commandments, it shows our love for Jesus. So that was the second very important doctrine, was the doctrine of baptism. So Darren would say this was just a flyover. And it truly was. It was just a flyover. So if you want to come Wednesday night uh, to our Bible study, we will talk a little bit more more details, but I just wanted to share all of this with you because I think it is so important that we have a right understanding of what the Bible actually teaches about those things. So, do you know with absolute certainty that you will go to heaven? That's really the most important question. Do you know with absolute certainty that you will go to heaven? And if you don't, please come to Jesus today. You, you can come to Jesus right now. Cry out to Jesus to save you. Jesus is waiting for you. And we talk about this every Sunday here at the Grace Place. Through the songs and through what we share, what we preach. All of us. We are sinners, and we are totally lost in our sin. And if you die in your sin without trusting in Jesus, you will be separated for all eternity. That means eternal punishment, torment, forever. It will never stop. But God, because that's the bad news, that we are all sinners, and we cannot do anything about it. But the good news is, that God did what we cannot do. Jesus lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He died for our sins on the cross, and then he rose again on the third day. And whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, has forgiveness of sins and receives the free gift of eternal life. If you have never done this, it is very simple. You, you can say something like this. You can say, Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I'm totally lost in my sin and I, I cannot save myself. I cannot do anything about it. Jesus, I believe that you never sinned. I believe that you are perfect. And I believe that you, Jesus, died for my sin on the cross. And I believe that you conquered death, that you left the grave behind, that you rose from the dead. And I want to put my trust in you and in you alone, for the forgiveness of my sins. And I want to ask you, Jesus, to give me the free gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That's it. So today we talked about two very important doctrines. We talked about the Holy Spirit and about baptism. And I will close with something David Jeremiah wrote in one of his Turning Point daily devotionals. It is about the Holy Spirit, and it really helps us to understand how powerful it is 
that as believers in Jesus, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So David, David Jeremiah, he wrote, It would be nice to be told when we leave on a long car trip, something like this. I want you to know that you are going to reach your destination safely and on schedule, regardless of what happens on the way. I mean, you may get lost. You may encounter a fierce rainstorm. And you may have a flat tire. Don't worry. I am here to promise you that you will arrive. And we have been given such a promise by God concerning our spiritual journey. And then he said, the promise comes in the form of a seal. And the seal of the Holy Spirit. Paul uses language common to the ancient world. A seal affixed to documents by kings and authorities made them official and invite. Invi I cannot say that, upon pain of death or, or punishment. So no one dared to violate the terms of a document that bore an official seal. And no one in the spiritual realm would dare violate the plan God has for those he has sealed. And as Paul wrote, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The Holy Spirit, living in every Christian, dwelling in every Christian, is God's seal that we will make it to heaven. It's God's guarantee that we will make it to heaven. And then he said, don't let obstacles along the road to eternity shake your confidence in God's promise. The Holy Spirit is God's seal that you will arrive. I think that's pretty powerful. It is so comforting to know that the Holy Spirit is God's seal that we will safely arrive in heaven. And during our time here on earth, our responsibility is to live in a way that brings glory to God. And my prayer for all of us is that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we will walk in the Spirit moment by moment and step by step fully knowing that the only way we can truly please God is by depending on the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the only way. So, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. Depend on the Holy Spirit in everything you do. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much that the Holy Spirit lives in us who are believers in Jesus. Thank you that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray that you will help us, every single one of us, this coming week, to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to depend on the Holy Spirit living in us in everything we do. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above the law, and the angels cry, Holy, O creation, Christ, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy. to get together every Sunday to worship you, Jesus. You are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, yet you humble yourself because you love us so much and thank you that you made it possible for us to have a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you sacrificed yourself for us on the cross, that you died for our sins so that we can live. 
I pray that you will bless our time now together as we, this time of fellowship and that we, as we enjoy this meal together. I pray, Jesus, that you will use this to bring glory to yourself. And I pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.